So today, uh, let me uh, ask you to join me in silencing your telephone. And also a reminder that we're going to video this seminar. We've got two cameras set up here, so if you're concerned about perhaps having the back of your head in that video, you might want to change seats, although that's going to be a little tough today. Um, but uh, today, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome our speaker, Dr. Stephen Gaines, who is a professor in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, Steve earned his PhD from Oregon State University, and he started as a faculty member, as an assistant, and then associate professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Brown University. In the interest of full disclosure, he was on my committee when I was a graduate student there, and he left to go to Santa Barbara uh, about a year or so before I defended. So uh, he then moved on to the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he is currently uh, the director of the Marine Science Institute. From 2002 to 2005, he served as the acting vice chancellor for research at UCSB, and then in 2007 and 2008. He also served as an acting dean of the Division of Mathematical Life and Physical Sciences at UCSB. Uh, under Steve's leadership, apparently, uh, ground is soon going to be broken, or already has been broken, on a UCSB Outreach Center for Teaching Ocean Science, which is uh, designed to house exhibits and interactive displays to help connect students, educators, and community groups with um, innovative uh, ocean science research. Uh, Steve's research focuses on marine ecology and conservation, sustainable fisheries, the design of marine reserves, the impact of climate change on marine habitats, and coupling between ocean circulation and the dynamics of marine species. Uh, Steve currently serves as a science advisor for the Joint Ocean Commission, an organization dedicated to achieving a coherent and coordinated national ocean policy grounded in ecosystem-based management. Uh, Steve is a principal investigator for PISCO, the Partnership for Interdisciplinary Studies of Coastal Oceans, which is a long-term ecosystem research and monitoring program established with the goals of understanding the dynamics of the coastal, coastal ocean ecosystem along the U.S. West Coast. Um, and in 2003 to 2006, Steve held the uh, prestigious Pew Marine Conservation Fellowship. It was in 2008 that Steve was a co-author on a paper describing an innovative fisheries management strategy called Hat Shares, which uh, he and his co-authors proposed to reverse fisheries collapse. That paper was selected by the editors of the journal Nature as one of the research highlights for 2008. So today, Steve is going to talk to us about um, New, well, let's see, change his title a little bit. So, the status of uh, global fisheries. And the other thing I forgot to mention in my introduction was that Steve has been um, instrumental in uh, the organization and creation of the Brennan School of Environmental Science and uh, Management as well. So, with that introduction, Steve, welcome to Georgetown. Thank you. Matt, it's a pleasure to be here. And if any of you want to know some stories about Matt as a grad student, see you know, <laughs> <laughs> he had nothing to do with me leaving Brown. <laughs> I do have some good stories. Um, so I'm going to talk about fish. As Matt said, I've worked on a whole variety of different issues in oceans. And um, in the last five years, I have gotten involved in fisheries and sustainable fisheries in a very big way. And it's a really interesting topic, and I suspect there are no marine science students in the room. That's what I'm assuming, right? So I'm not assuming you know anything about oceans. Um, but I want to motivate you for why you should be thinking about oceans in a very big way. Um, first, oceans are really valuable to people in a whole variety of different ways. Um, just a few uh, key metrics. They provide about a fifth of all the protein that people consume. Main source for over a billion people, that's going to be going up in a dramatic way. Big, important source of livelihoods, particularly in the developing world for small-scale fisheries, more than 300 million people. And of course, they're you know, a major source of inspiration and things along those lines. Now, um, from the standpoint of these kinds of things that people value from the ocean, it wasn't that long ago that the perception of the ocean was that it was really this source of endless bounty. And the reason was because it was big. Um, our technology to actually uh, fish in most of the ocean was limited. And as a consequence, 
even as little as 100 years ago, there were major scientific organizations from prominent developed countries who concluded that you did not need to manage fisheries because there was really no way that humans could have any impact on fish in the sea. So to get that notion out of the way very quickly, um, a real simple way to see that in fact people can have a very big impact on the ocean is just to look at in 1965, so when I was 10 years old, this, all of these areas in red were the parts of the ocean where we were fishing the total, the total catch was at or above the capacity that you would be able to catch at a maximum sustainable level. Right? So that's how much of the ocean we were at in 1965. 30 years later, when my daughter was 10 years old, this is what the picture looked like. So we went from a situation where there were a few small areas around very intensely fished uh, countries to basically the entire ocean being fished at or above capacity in just a few decades. Okay, and so what this clearly means is that one, we no longer have the option that if we aren't managing fisheries well to go someplace else, that there's no place else to go. Right? So, the, question, the whole point of this talk is really going to be asking, where are, you know, how, how are the fish and fisheries doing at a global scale? And what does the answer to this question mean uh, in a, to a whole variety of aspects of uh, things that are important to people? So that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, if, I've already given you a little bit of the demand, but just to make the, this point even more as to why this is a key issue. If we look today at the consumption of animal protein in a variety of different forms by people on the planet, um, this is where we are. We're at about 375 million tons per year of consumable animal material. If we project out 50 years, just 50 years, this is what this picture looks like. And the reason why it grows so much is because there's really two things that are affecting the demand for animal protein. One is the fact that the number of people is going to grow over this period of time. That's this part. But about half of this growth in demand is because of uh, changes in the level of wealth, mostly in the developing world, and what that typically has led to in terms of shifts in diet from more uh, agricultural products to meat products. Right? So uh, this is a, uh, a gigantic increase, and I'm going to come back to this a little bit later, talking about a little bit about um, how big of a problem this is. But you can just imagine that you know here's the part that we're getting from wild caught fisheries today. If if that's going to go down, it makes this problem of growth in demand get worse. And so we need to know what's the trend in terms of supply of food from the sea. Um, or if we if we're already if we have the potential of expanding this in a way that would provide a larger uh, yield, how much of this of this demand could be met by uh, fixing fisheries if we're already overfishing? Right? So there's lots of issues associated with the potential value of getting this. There are also I could have made the same kind of arguments in terms of what the implications might be to biodiversity and a whole variety of other ways. But this is a simple way to motivate it. It's going to affect the food that people eat. We need to know the answers to these things. So. Okay, so uh, the, I mean, why would I be giving a, a seminar on what's the status of global fisheries if the answer weren't hard? I mean, if, it were, if this were a simple thing to do, um, everybody would know the answer. Um, but it's it's actually really hard, and it's hard for some very obvious reasons that I can can make in very simple points that. If we were asking this question about are we over harvesting things on land, we would know the answer because it's in your face, right? When you, the, the level of consumption and harvesting relative to the amount of resource that's there and productivity, you can see it. You can see it in a way that makes it relatively easy to count and measure and so on and so forth. Um, that's not true in the ocean because most of these things we can't see. Right? And more importantly, the things that we have is information, we have a lot of information about fish, but it all comes in the form of this, which is how much we take out. But to answer this question about the status of fisheries and where they're going, we need to know this, how many are in the water. Right? So this is the problem. We can't see under the water very well. For the vast majority of these kinds of fisheries, you can't go just go underwater and go diving and count them and look. 
Um, and so we have this big challenge of thinking about how do we estimate the number of fish in a way that allows us to say, are we catching too many, too few, and how should we be changing things like that? So scientists have, uh, have been dealing with this for a long time, and we call these counts um, a stock assessment, which is assessing the number of individuals within a stock. Um, the science has become extremely rich and elaborate, and basically it involves uh, taking models. These are models that are models of both the fish and the fishermen. Because you have to, uh, since we're not able to count the fish directly, you have to infer a lot of things about the nature of how many fish there are there. And some of that you can come from taking estimates of the fish and other parts from how people respond to different kinds of regulations. Okay, and the kinds of information, we have biology, the life history of the fish, we have information on how much is being caught. We, uh, in, in, in these really good kinds of assessments, we have scientists going out and making independent surveys where they can standardize effort and things like that to count fish. And then we have uh, a whole variety of effort focused on measuring how much effort is going into fishing, which is really the whole modeling the people side of this. Where are they fishing? How much time are they fishing? New technologies, things along those lines. Um, the bottom line is these things can be very good, but they tend to be idiosyncratic to individual fisheries in terms of the nature of detail. We've developed this really complicated approach to estimating how many things there are. They're very good approaches, but they're very expensive on the order of costing half a million dollars to do a single assessment for a single species just one year. And so if you have to do this over and over and over again, this means that for the vast majority of fisheries on the planet, we can't count them because you can't afford them. They're not even worth that much um, in many of these cases. So we've got this big problem, that we have developed a scientific technology that the resource doesn't match with. Well, let's, let's look at what we have learned from these assessments. We've done, there are about 300 species on the planet where we have these kinds of elaborate scientific stock assessments. And there was a paper that was, came out in science a few years ago that looked at um, a summary of the status of these stocks and the color codes here are basically just the range of stocks that are in really good shape, ones that are in trouble but not collapsed, and ones where there's the average stock is actually at a point where you really need to stop fishing for a lot of things. And what you can see uh, from this is that some places are in great shape, New Zealand, Alaska, Canada, on this coast, some places are in terrible shape, the EU. Um, but the vast majority of the planet, there's no color for. And that's because we don't have any stock assessments for most of the planet. And so these tend to be the fisheries that are big, that are really valuable, and can afford to spend half a million or a million dollars a year to count fish every single year to make informed decisions. Um, this number is, this was a few years ago, this number has expanded a little bit to now where we actually have a few species counts in, in other parts of the world. Um, and what you see from this, from the color, is that, yeah, there are a few places where things are in bad shape, but for these fisheries that we actually have good counts, most of the world is actually not too bad off, right? which is good news. Um, and that may be, not be the story that you've heard from oceans uh, and what the status of fisheries is, but if we look at the ones where we have a lot of information, you know, on average, they're not doing too badly, and I'll give you a little bit more quantitative sense of that in just a second. Okay. Now, um, I want to go beyond just the um, using these colored maps and talk about a way of actually thinking about this problem a little bit more deeply, and it involves plotting fisheries on this kind of a uh, of a graph here, where we've, really, we've got two axes. One is a measure of the biomass or how much of the, you know, what's the total tonnage of fish that are out there relative to the biomass that would give us the maximum yield. Okay. And so values where that ratio is one are on this graph going to be here at the crosshairs. And values higher than that are situations where there's, there actually are more fish out there than would be the level you would be wanting to fish at to give maximum yield. Um, values below that means we have overfished that stock and it's rarer than you would want to get the maximum yield. So from that standpoint, this axis is measuring where these stocks are. 
So a value of one means they're about where you'd want them to be if your primary goal was food. And values greater than one means that there's potential for increased food by fishing harder. Values less than one means we've overfished. Okay? This axis is um, measuring how hard we're currently fishing. So it's the fishing mortality rate, the, the, fishing, the rate at which we're killing the fish in this particular one, relative to the rate that would give you a biomass that is at this maximum sustainable yield. Right? So that the harder, we're fi the harder you fish, the smaller the number of the stock size of fish will go down relative to how much they're reproducing. And so the target rate is this fishing mortality rate that eventually leads to a biomass of fish that gives you the highest productivity. That's what we're calling the maximum sustainable yield. So this again is a ratio where if you're fishing at a rate that's right what that target rate would be, you'd get a one on this crosshair. If you're fishing up here, you're fishing too hard. And so it means you're overfishing. As a, and, and if you're fishing down here, it means you're either underfishing if the stocks are too large or you're letting the stocks recover if you have already overfished them. Okay? So unlike the other axis, this, is an, this axis tells us where we're heading. If you're up in this space, your biomass is going to head down because you're fishing too hard relative to where you want to be. If you're down here, you're fishing lower than what it would take and stock sizes could increase. Okay, so if we're up here, biomass is going to go down. If we're down here, biomass should go up. So we can use this to kind of get a sense of where we are, where we're heading, by plotting all these fisheries in this kind of space. Now, the goal, of course, ideally, if your whole focus was on maximizing production of food, is you'd want everything to be right there at a value of one and one for those two axes. If your goal is profits and not food, you actually want to be down here. And the reason simply here is that maximum profits actually come um, when, you, when the stocks are still at a higher level to where we're catching fewer fish, but it costs us less to catch them. So that the ideal place in terms of economics is down in this corner. Right? So maximum yield, economics. Somewhere between those two is where you'd actually like us to be. So if we look at the 300 fisheries that I showed you that already have stock assessments. Every single one of these dots is a fishery. And the color code here is kind of a, a heat plot of where the concentration of fisheries are. You can see that you know, they're kind of centered right down here. It's not too far from this cross beam, which is crosshairs, where I, so I've already made the point that these fisheries are not in too bad of a shape. And, and even though on average it's a little bit below in biomass, we're also fishing a little bit lower level, which means that these stocks, if anything, should be recovering on average. So this is, this is pretty good news in looking at the stocks. We have a lot of information. And you can, do, you can look at a whole variety of things. So um, you can look at tunas, for example. Tuna is something you probably hear a lot about, about overfishing of bluefin tuna and things like that. Um, there's Atlantic bluefin tuna. That's a horrible place to be. It means you're up at about nine times the fishing mortality rate that you would want to be for a maximum sustainable population of bluefin tuna, substantially lower population size. But for most of the other tunas, they're actually in pretty good shape. Uh, you can look at this by country and see how uh, you, you know, there's a lot you can look at and learn from how countries uh, do things differently and manage fisheries. Uh, New Zealand's probably the gold standard in terms of management of fisheries. It's almost right on top of where you want to be for maximum economic performance of their fisheries. Uh, the U.S. is um, not too bad. I mean, it's it's in a point where we're fishing at a lower level because we had some fisheries in the past that have, that are that were overfished and now they're starting to recover. Uh, the European Union is the model for the planet in terms of assessed fisheries that you, nobody should be following, where the center of their fisheries is up here at a place where we're at about half of the biomass we want to be, and we're still overfishing. Okay. Not the place we want to be. There's all kinds of other fun things you can look at in terms of so fish that, for example, spend all of their time um, in the boundary of a single country, regardless of which country it is, are not in too bad a shape. As you increase the number of countries that those fish swim into, the story gets worse and worse and worse, right? For reasons that have to do with the fact the 
Tragedy of Commons, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. But basically, the fact that if multiple countries have to cooperate to get this right, they're more likely to overfish because they don't trust the other country to actually follow the same rules. And so you end up with this, as you go from to more fisheries, you know, you get to 10, and you're down here in the point, it's much more like the European Union. OK, so that's a quick overview of these 300. Uh, but the question I want to ask is, how biased is this picture? When that paper was published in Science a few years back, they used the argument that um, these are the fisheries we know the most about, so this is where we should really be basing our analysis on. Um, but as I've already told you, it's only 300 fisheries. Whereas on the planet, there's somewhere between 15 and 20,000 fisheries, depending on how you want to count them. So it's a very minute fraction of the total number of fisheries. And so we want to look at you know, how things are. There have been a number of attempts to do this that have used some very indirect ways of establishing the, the level of fisheries. Um, there have been a number of very high profile, profile papers. All of these things came out of papers in Science or Nature that projected that the status of fisheries was in bad shape. But they used um, metrics which were very simplistic and for which fisheries biologists rebelled in saying that that's not an adequate measure of the status of stocks and that you really can't trust uh, the answers that have come out of a lot of these different kinds of metrics and stuff. So it's left open, the, despite the fact that these papers, you know, and this one in particular, projected the end of fisheries by 2048. Um, from the scientific standpoint, there's been a lot of pushback that these views of these other unassessed fisheries are not really adequate for us to be able to understand what's going on. So what we did uh, uh, starting about a year ago was um, look at this from the standpoint of thinking about how do, how do we gain some much more quantitative insight on the status of all these fisheries. And we started with the simple notion that the only way we're going to expand the number of fisheries is we can only use information that we have for a lot of fisheries. So we said, what do we know about a whole bunch of different fisheries? And we're not going to try to develop a, a, a technique that requires us to have information that we don't have. That's what stock assessments have basically done. So these are the kinds of things that we have a lot of information on. We have some information about the biology of a whole variety of different species, general characteristics, which we know will affect how the stock will respond to different levels of catch. We have lots of information about how many things have been caught over time, and patterns of catch can tell you something about the fishery. And we know something about how the fishery developed. Did it ramp up really quickly or develop slowly? All of, all of these things have the potential for affecting what's the, the uh, number of fish that are still left out there in the sea. The other big innovation, though, the thing, reason why we're able to solve this problem is that we didn't try to fit, pre actually predict how many fish there are. We just tried to predict this ratio. And that becomes important because um, in, if you look at virtually any population in ecology, as a function of its biomass from being extinct up to the biomass it would be if humans are not harvesting it. Um, the yield, the sustainable yield that you can get out of that is this kind of a hump-shaped relationship. The reason why the maximum sustainable yield is in the middle here is because the productivity of the fish population, or any population, actually goes up as you reduce the number of individuals. You're reducing competition and a variety of other kinds of ecological interactions that reduce its productivity <laughs> to some intermediate level where the potential for a sustainable harvest reaches a peak at an intermediate biomass. Right? So that this means that if you're above or below this point, the and you harvest a certain amount, the ability of the stock to go, the likelihood of the stock's going to go up or down depends upon where you are relative to this point. Okay? That if you're right at this level, you can take out a high amount and it'll stay constant. If you take out the exact same number of fish and you're down here, the stock size will plummet in size. So it, so it turns out that it's actually much easier for us to predict where we are relative to this than to know biomass or the biomass sustainable yield. In fact, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of things about where fisheries are relative to this target. And for not any of these fisheries do I know what the biomass is or what the maximum is. biomass that gives you maximum sustainable yields. All I know is how close we are to that value. That's what we're estimating. And that turned out to be um, 
that the trick that allowed us to actually glean a lot of insight in a whole bunch of different fisheries. Now, here's the mathematical model. Study it quickly. Um, it basically incorporates all of these kinds of uh, characteristics. We utilize, we parameterize the model utilizing fisheries we know a lot about, and we use this to forecast ones we don't know that much about. I can talk at length about the model if you want to, but probably don't. Um, but what we've been able to do is expand the number of fisheries by several thousand now, um, uh, uh, and, and expand this out to now where we can start getting a global picture of what the status of fish stocks are. So here's what we find. Um, let's start with this black line. So this is time, 30 years of time. This value here is where the biomass is relative to BMSY. Again, ideally you want to be about a value of one. For the fisheries where we have stock assessments, you know, it's gone dipped down below one, but it's kind of stabilized. And if anything, there's evidence that because of the fact we know these stocks have been overfished, agencies in some countries have taken action to where we actually let them rebuild. Okay, and so that is a pretty good picture. If the world looked like this, things would be great. Um, here's what we find for this entire group of unassessed stocks, is they have a very different pattern. One, on average, they're in worse shape. Um, by the end, we're down to about a value of about 0.6. Um, the, blue, the red is the median for the group of several thousand fisheries. The blue lines here are estimates of the 95% confidence of all of that status. Um, the other thing that's key, though, is that this line just continues to go down. There's no evidence that this is leveling off, despite the fact that these stocks are in substantially worse shape. We can break it up by different types of fish, and there's... Uh, uh, really dramatic differences in terms of the status of different kinds of fish. So some fisheries, um, these uh, flounders and ground fishes, tunas and billfish, which I already showed you, are not that far below a value of one. At the other end of the scale, we have sharks and cartilage and fishes, which are dramatically below where you want them to be. And this very large group, the width of these bars, has to do with the number of fisheries. So this is a very diverse group of of uh, coastal fisheries uh, that are lots of different species uh, and a very prominent component of small-scale fisheries in the developing world, uh, down at about a half. And in fact, one of the surprising things that came out of this was that even if, if we look at these fisheries that are previously unassessed, the ones that are small-scale artisanal fisheries are in substantially worse shape throughout this entire period of time than the ones that are larger scale fisheries. Now part of this may be um, just a reflection of the fact that larger fisheries are larger populations of fish and it's harder for us to drive them down to smaller levels, it's hard to say, but the small scale fisheries are down here at a level that's about half of where you want them to be. So if you just think about what that means, if we fixed the problem of small scale fisheries you would and moved it up back to a value of one, you would double the number of those fish in the ocean. And at the same time, you'd roughly double the catch that you'd get out of those species. Okay, so it's a really big effect. OK, so here's the global picture you saw before, spatial pattern for different parts of the world, the well-known part of the world for stock assessed fisheries. Here's what it looks like when you um, now put in all of these other stocks. And there's a whole variety of things that come out of this. this I mean, there's this is all kinds of uh, projects we're looking into, different regional kinds of things, but a, a few things to point out. One is that places that do really well um, with stock assessed fisheries, such as the US and Canada on the, in the Pacific Coast, um, can be dramatically poor performance. Exact same institutions um, when we don't have stock assessments. So that's one thing, is that on average things tend to be worse, there's a lot more red color. Don't put too much stock into the fact that there's a nice green spot over here because the other thing is these, these uh, diagonal lines means that these are regions where we don't even hit 25% of the catch in terms of fisheries we can forecast with our method. So the vast majority of fisheries in this region right here, for example, are ones that we can't even pull together the information that I use to assess the status of the stocks. So the, the likelihood is that if, if on average stocks that 
have not been assessed before are in worse shape. Ones that they don't even keep records of cash are going to be probably even substantially worse shape. So this is probably not um, really saying anything significant uh, for those particular areas. So substantially worse off even in the same place. Now let's go back to that uh, crosshairs plot because we also can um, came up with a way for us not only to estimate where the biomass was, but also where our best estimate of the fishing pressure is, mainly based upon how biomass changes through time. And so here's a plot for all of the countries of the world. The size of the, uh, the bubble here is the magnitude of the catch that that country has. And then the center is where the midpoint is for our projection of the status of the stock relative and the fishing pressure. The, the, red, the, the values in red are the values for the countries where we have stock assessments. The ones in blue are for the fisheries where we didn't have stock assessments. And the general trend you can see, as you've already seen, is that things move to lower biomass. That's what you've seen so far. Things are on average about half where they are. The bad news is not only are they at half the biomass, they have dramatically higher fish and mortality rates at the moment. Right? So this is the last place you want to see all of these because if anything it means that that Decline in biomass is, if anything, going to accelerate on the basis of what we estimate for these fish and mortality rates. Okay. Um, so the other thing we can do on this is we can actually look at these things through time. So I'm going to play a movie here, where every one of these is a, again a different country, and we're going to. This is the starting point in 1955, where things are not in bad shape. Um, they're being underfished and. They have a reasonable number of fish. And then here's what's going to happen over the ensuing 50 some years. Now, there's a lot of variability, and I wouldn't put much stock into any individual year's uh, estimates here. But the general point of this is as you saw at the end point in the last thing, is that these fisheries, even though they were previously unassessed 50 years ago, were sitting down here, this is where we started, and now the median point is up here where we're at about half of the biomass, and we're fishing at about 70% oh, higher rate than you should be for going at maximum sustainable yield. We can do this um, looking at another thing. So one of the things when we first pulled this information together, we thought, well, this is just a, a developed world versus developing world problem in that the, the real he issue here is that you've got weak institutions in a number of different parts of the world. And so um, when we saw the fact that small scale fisheries and unassessed fisheries were in worse shape, we thought that this was really going to parse out in terms of the development status of nations. But that turned out to be exactly backwards of what we found. Um, so I've, I've got, I've plotted here the developed nations excluding Europe because we already know Europe is bad. <laughs> so we're making this group be as good as they possibly can. Um, and what you see is that the developed nations um, actually excluding Europe have just as bad of a reaction in terms of managing these fisheries that we didn't know stock assessments on as Europe does. Um, and if anything, what happens with the developing nations is they follow almost the identical path, but with a 20-year lag. And so I actually think that what this suggests is that there's really no difference between these other than the intensification of the fishing effort that developed and developing nations can actually apply to these fisheries, and that we're seeing uh, just a, 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 you know, the exact same trajectory displaced in time. You can also do this by the different groups of fishes. Um, and the, again, the real bad story here is what's happening with sharks and cartilaginous fishes, which get way up there. But you get the message. What happens is you, as we look over time, is that in these unassessed fisheries, biomass goes down, and then what happens? Fishing mortality rate goes up. And it's exactly consistent with the kind of behavior you'd expect that, look, we used to be catching this many fish. It's getting harder, but we've got to continue to catch this many fish to maintain our livelihoods and everything. So the effort goes up and up and up. And the fishing mortality rate continues to go up. And the consequence is that the stocks that they're fishing get worse and worse and worse. That's the problem. 
All right, so that's kind of a, a quick view of where things are. Um, let's come back to what this means. Um, so um, I, I, I showed you this before already in terms of this growth in demand. If we look today at globally at the pattern of use of seafood, um, this map here shows the dark blues are places where more than 20% uh, of the protein that people consume comes from the sea. The red dots are places where the, um, the level of malnourishment is above uh, 20% as well in those. But, but there's this, you know, this concentration, of course, in the developing tropics of where there's a very high dependence on the sea uh, for, for food. And there's also a, a current, in many of these cases, a current problem with, with malnutrition. Um, this doesn't break out where this growth in demand is going to occur, but it almost all occurs in that exact same region, the increase in wealth and the increase in population size. Um, so that the fact that we've got a situation where, one, this value is lower than it could be um, in terms of seafood production, and if anything, the trajectory is for that to get smaller through time, means that it's going to exacerbate this problem, particularly since the places where the problem is the worst is in these kinds of small-scale coastal fisheries that these kinds of countries really depend on. Um, there are all kinds of reasons why um, we need to be concerned about this beyond this. One is that the alternative options for meeting this food demand are not pretty. There have been several analyses that have looked at how we meet this demand from land-based production of food, and they're horrible choices. Um, the, consequences in terms of land conversion, greenhouse gas emissions, nutrient runoff from the land into oceans, and a whole variety of other things uh, to meet that growth in, in, in demand over the next 50 years are really daunting if you only look at this as a land problem. So the C part, particularly the C part that basically says, if we fix the problem of managing wild caught fisheries, it's, you know, there's no environmental cost. It's only environmental benefit of that because we get more fish. It actually becomes easier to catch them. So by every one of these kinds of metrics, things get better. Um, the other side of this is that, you know, in terms of meeting that demand, even to this day, what the, the amount of tons of meat protein that you can get from fish is still the cheapest way of producing food. And the fact that this is a, uh, a problem that is accentuated in parts of the world where the average income is going to be much lower. I think this is a really key problem. So one of the advantages we have, other advantages of knowing what the status of the stocks is, is it allows us for the first time to say, what's the upside of fixing the problem? Because in the past we could say, well, we know these things are going to overfish, but if you don't really have a good estimate of how bad we overfish they are, you can't say how much better could things be if you fix the problem. Well, now we start having these quantitative estimates for a larger fraction of the world's fisheries. We can estimate what that value is. And here's what comes out of um, our analyses, is that it really depends upon where you are as to how big the upside is. And part of this has to do with the fact that um, many of these areas where the upside is not very big tend to be places that are uh, where the bulk of the catch is actually coming from these very large, wealthy, already stock assessed fisheries that are in pretty good shape, so there's not much upside. Uh, but for uh, many other parts of the world, the upside is, and I just stopped this at 100%, more than a doubling of the catch. And so how this maps onto the geography of individual countries is kind of a next step in terms of what this might mean, in terms of where to focus efforts, how to think about this from the standpoint of, of demand versus supply, but it, it shows that Fixing the um, fish problem has the potential of playing at least a significant role in this looming uh, global food security problem. So what I've said so far is that um, data poor fisheries, the ones we don't know a lot about, are in worse shape. Okay? This shows, I think, a lot about the value of information. That if you don't know the status of the stocks, how can you make informed decisions? Um, it's definitely not just a developing world country. Um, problem, that you know, the exact same pattern happens even in countries like New Zealand, which are gold standards for the ones with stock assessment. And the other key point here, though, is that fixing the problem gives you simultaneous benefits in both food, conservation, and livelihoods. So this is a no-brainer that we need to be doing this. The challenge is how do we do it, right? 
And it's clearly a complicated problem to fix it because why would we have literally tens of thousands of fisheries be getting into this really bad shape if in fact fixing the problem were simple? So we, I, I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about the nature of the solutions that we're working on on this and a number of other people are working on. And I've kind of put them into three general categories to kind of show where we're going. One is that we need new tools um, to be able to manage these things well. We can't rely on these really expensive stock assessments. The second is we need more rights for reasons I'll talk about in a second, and I think we need new pipelines for how we get uh, science and academia involved in helping um, these solutions happen at a faster pace. So the new, new tools is made is very clear from the fact, you know, this is the value of information, uh, the, when you don't know what's going on, they on average are in worse shape. So we need to get information. We need to get information in the hands of small-scale fisheries that could work in the developing world um, that don't cost a lot of money. Right? And so that's a very different scientific challenge, to look at this problem of not to come up with a gold standard way of counting fish, but to come up with ways that allow us to get a pretty good estimate for virtually no money. That's really what we need here. We need to be able to get 80% of the insight of a stock assessment for less than 1% of the cost. And if we can do that, then we, then we can really make some advances. And it, it, it means you have to ask the scientific question in a very different way to be able to do that uh, and make it relevant. And it's got to apply to you know, these thousands of little teeny fisheries. And so this is part of the challenge. And we need, we need something that is clearly not going to involve having to have big institutions Lots of universities involved helping do stock assessments, things along those lines. That's not going to be it. It's got to be something where it's real simple data that allow local communities to be able to estimate whether or not they should be increasing or decreasing their catch. There's a whole variety of things that are emerging this way. It's a really uh, interesting time. I don't, I don't, I don't want to go into them, but I mean, just as one example, um, one of the things that we have worked on a lot is uh, setting aside protected areas in the ocean where fishing is excluded. There are lots of reasons to do this. Uh, there are a variety of conservation reasons and things along those lines. But one of the things that turns out is that, and it, as you can imagine, most fishermen hate no fishing zones, right? But here's a reason why they should like them. And there are lots of reasons why they should like them. But here's another one. Um, and this is that the information content in a no fishing zone really helps you evaluate whether you're overfishing. And it's a real simple thing, just looking at the sizes of the fish that are outside versus the no fishing zone. You can estimate what that fishing mortality rate is that you are applying. And so uh, there's a, just by looking at sizes of what your catch is and what the catch is in protected areas, you can come up with an estimate of what your fishing mortality rate should be and what a catch should be that's really simple. And it just it shows the management value of having a place that you can use as a reference to say, how heavily are we fishing by comparing it to a place where we're not? And, so, and there's, this is just one of maybe 10 different approaches that people have now started to develop uh, that, are, that are based upon really simple information that have the potential of getting us a lot of insight. OK, so we need new tools. We also need new rights. And new rights um, comes from the fact that um, anybody that, you know, how many of you know what the tragedy of commons is? Everybody always raised their hand, but nonetheless, I always think I have to tell you what it is. Um, because there's this classic problem that we all think we know what it is, and yet um, we continue to manage a whole variety of things in a way that makes this continue to happen. So if you're not absolutely clear what the tragedy of commons is, here's an example. <laughs> so imagine you have two kids and one very cold smoothie, two plus. Right? What's going to happen? Who's going to drink faster? <laughs> they're, they're both going to try to drink faster than the other one, right? Because they're both going to say, I can't. Uh, there's no way that he's only going to drink half of this. So I'm going to suck as fast as I can. And they're both going to say that, right? And they may come out with exactly half that if they had just partitioned it up, they would do this. But no, they're going to drink it as fast as they can because they don't trust the other one. And you get a break. <laughs> so if you substitute fish for the smoothie, fishermen for the kids, and brain freaks for the class fishery. That's what the tragedy of commons is in fisheries. This is exactly what we do in most fisheries around the world with this 
open access where we may have a regulation that says the season goes from here to here and you blow the whistle, what does everybody do? They, all, they race as fast as they can because they, if they want to cut back a little bit or decide that, no, if I catch these a month from now, I can get more money, the season could be closed. You know, so it's, there's this incentive for them to be racing as fast as they can in the short term. They do all kinds of things which you would look at in the long term as being stupid. You know, that they, if they waste money, it's very inefficient the way they catch them. It costs a lot more. The price goes down because they flood the market as they're racing early on. It's exactly the same as the brain fees that apply to nature. So the economists for decades have argued that the way to solve this problem is you put more ownership into the uh, resource that allows you to change behavior. So for example, in this case, you imagine how the game would be changed if they each had half a glass. Um, the same amount, separate straws, where they can't influence the amount. They would drink that smoothie in a totally different way. They would steward their smoothie and get much more maximum benefit out of it and all kinds of great things like this. Right? So in the context of fisheries, um, this kind of notion of giving rights to individual shares that gives some security of catch is something called catches. And there's a whole variety of ways that these can be put in place. This is the paper that Matt talked about. One of the ways that, you, that, that I highlighted New Zealand as being the global standard, they went into one of these, uh, into these individual quota systems uh, decades ago. And, and so one way to do it is exactly this, where you get X percent of the catch and the, the amount is tradable and things along those lines. And there's some security that means that you don't have to race with anybody else because you know you get to catch a certain number of fish this year. And you can do it in a way that minimizes costs and maximizes profits. And the effects can be really dramatic. Uh, on average, the estimate on these is that the cost of catching the fish goes down by about 30%. The price they get, on average, goes up by about 30%, even if they don't catch any more fish. So that the profitability of the business goes way up. And it completely changes the nature of the interaction. But another way is something much more analogous to what we do on land, which is property rights. Um, you can have a share of the catch being allocated by individuals or groups of individuals having exclusive access to a particular part of the ocean. We don't do this very much <coughs> in uh, the developed world because of common property law and a whole variety of things in terms of the way uh, the legal structure for the oceans is. But there are a few places, um, Chile and Japan, where this has been implemented a lot. There are other, other ways of putting shares in but. I want to highlight this one spatial because I want to come back to this. I talked about small scale fisheries. <coughs> and the fact that the one group here that's in really bad shape, um, that's really relevant to these small scale fisheries, is this group. This is this group that is exactly characteristic. It's the coastal fisheries that a lot of these small scale artisanal fisheries are really focusing on. And it's at less than half of where you want to be for a sustainability target. So this is exactly the group that I think is most um, relevant for thinking about these kinds of spatial property rights. And just give you a quick example. These things are often called TERFs, Territorial User Rights Fisheries, where you, a group of people have exclusive rights. Um, this is work from uh, a Chilean scientist, Stefan Gelsich. Chile had, their most valuable fishery was this thing that looks like an abalone, it's called a loco. Um, it collapsed in the 1990s. The whole fishery was shut down for five years. It went from being a multi-million dollar fishery to nothing. And during this time, a couple scientists, including an economist, recommended putting in, in, in place these kinds of spatial rights for individual fishermen. So if groups of 40 or 50 fishermen can get a particular stretch of the ocean that is their exclusive fishing area. And since that law was put in place, there are now about 700 of these turfs that have been put in place, about 40,000 fishermen. And they've had really dramatic effects. So the open access areas, comparable kinds of habitats um, that are still under the old rules, have densities of these locos which are minute compared to the densities you see within these turfs that are being managed now by the fishermen. That, and the densities, the number of, of, of locos inside is comparable to what you see in complete no fishing zones. Now these are not as big, they're, you know, but they're still managing them at densities which are very high um, compared to what we see under the kind of open access. And the catch rates are about a factor of 10 higher than they are in the areas inside. 
there's all kinds of other things that have emerged. This, this work that Stefan has done is really amazing. They are also big biodiversity benefits. They start managing these areas for um, the whole ecosystem. Because even though they're only fishing a handful of species, they realize that, well, these other things are what locos eat or what provide local habitats. And so they start doing all kinds of really interesting things on the uh, biodiversity side. And what, they, what we've seen is that the biodiversity has gone up about halfway to what it is in complete no fishing zones inside of these turfs compared to the areas outside. So really big benefits. And you know, I could talk a long time about this, but I think one of the key ways that we're really gonna deal with thousands of small scale fisheries is by putting more rights and at the same time giving these people more tools to be able to effectively make decisions about what they do. Although it's clear here that uh, these guys were fine with the existing tools in terms of how well they've been able to manage this. So the last, the last point um, I think is that we need to uh, get academia engaged more in, in building a more direct pipeline between uh, these prob identifying the problems, characterizing solutions, designing what these solutions might look like, and actually seeing them in. And the notion that, that academia should play a role <coughs> where we do these studies, we publish things, and then we hope somebody actually uses it, um, is just not an efficient way to solve these problems. And so we've been building uh, and developing a number of partnerships um, that are working with government organizations and NGOs to really think about how we can really shorten the timeline between coming up with identified solutions <coughs> and seeing them implemented in a very big way. The one that's most uh, interesting and exciting is this really big effort with uh, two conservation NGOs <coughs> called RARE and the Environmental Defense Fund. They're both based right here in Washington, D.C. This is an effort called Fish Forever, and it takes advantage of the fact that what RARE's expertise in is social marketing of solutions to local communities to get them to be inspired to take action and value their conservation benefits. They really understand how to sell good ideas and get people to, to try things that are in their long-term best interests. EDF is very good in terms of the setting up the policy for how these kinds of rights-based management systems actually would work and the kind of enabling conditions you need for that to work. And then what we provide in this situation is how do you design your turf? You know, if you're going to go into a new place, how big should it be? Should you include some protected areas? Things along these lines to uh, affect the performance. And can we forecast, if people do this, what the changes are likely to be and how fast they're likely to see them? And the combination, I think it takes all three of these kinds of things, the right enabling conditions, um, a, a way to really take good ideas and actually replicate them in an interesting way with designs that can be applied in a whole variety of places for us to pull this off. So we're, um, we have very ambitious goals for this in terms of literally trying to uh, change the direction of hundreds if not a few thousand of the world's fisheries by implementing known solutions in a replicated way in a very large number of places. But there, the main point of this is I think we really need to get engaged as academics um, to really shorten this pipeline between coming up with potential solutions and evaluating how these things might work and how they design and working with partners that can work at these things. So I'll stop there and be happy to answer questions.